So now we will be covering the liabilities part. Now what are the NDAs which are related to a liability side? So until then what we have seen is property plan and equipment, investment property, we have seen intangible assets, we have seen borrowing costs capitalized to these assets, we have also seen impairment of assets, we have also seen NDAs 105 which relates to these assets. So all these which we have covered is relating to the assets. But there are also standards which relate to the liabilities. Now you need to understand when I, when I say liabilities, it includes both equity and liabilities. To the extent of equities, I'll put it aside because equities are dealt as per a different standard called as India's uh, 32109. So I'll park them aside. But I will talk about predominantly the other liabilities. Your non-current and current liabilities are the two liabilities which are covered out there. Under your current and non-current liabilities, we have the distinction of financial and non-financial liabilities as well. So we have certain liabilities which are classified as financial and certain liabilities which are not class which are classified as non-financial in nature. These financial and non these financial liabilities, be it of non-current or current in nature, are discussed under India's 32 and 109. So these two standards will talk about financial assets as well as financial liabilities. So even that part from the liability side is also gone. So majority of the liability side, be it your equities or financial liabilities, are covered under the standard of 32 and 109. Then what are the other liabilities which get covered under the standards which we are going to look at now? So the other liabilities that I'm trying to look at is the non-current liabilities. Now among the non-current liabilities also, what we are going to look at is provisions. So there are certain long-term provisions and even current provisions. So your long-term provisions made for employee benefits, which is a very, very important standard. And other one is your current provisions or any other short-term provisions that you have. These short-term provisions or your current provisions will be discussed as a part of India's 37, which deals with not just provisions, but also deals with contingent assets and contingent liabilities as well. So we will primarily start with the employee benefits part, which is a very important and a noted standard. And one thing that I want to clarify before we enter the session, that don't have a preconceived notion that this is a very difficult standard because actually it is not. It is not a very difficult standard. It's a very simple standard, but you need a lot of common sense to apply. It requires you to apply some common sense. I don't need you to apply some accounting sense or technical sense. Purely a common sense approach is sufficient for you to understand and interpret and also reproduce in your exam, your India's 19, which deals with employee benefits. The other simple standard is India's 37, which deals with provisions, contingent assets and contingent liabilities happens to be a very, very plain, simple vanilla standard. Okay. So while we come to this concept of India's 19, let's see what India's 19 talks about. India's 19 talks about accounting for employee benefits. Now, when I say employee benefit, so I need to understand, first of all, who is this person who is called as an employee? First thing. Number two. What are the benefits which are included into the employee? I think the picture down below is sufficient enough explanation that you have employee means it covers both the employee as well as their family. Absolutely right. So when I talk about an employee, the benefits which are arising to an employee are not just necessarily directly to the employee, but could also provide benefits to the family of the employee as well. So it could apply to the spouse of the employee, or to the children of the employee or any other dependent of the employee. So benefits which are arising or benefits which are applicable to an employee or his spouse or his children or any other dependent will get covered as far as the standard is concerned. You have multiple multinational companies which provide employee with healthcare support. Now healthcare support is basically whenever there's an emergency, whatever healthcare requirement is there, the uh, the company will reimburse the com uh, the employee to that extent. Now some employees or some employers basically cover employees health as well as the children's health along with the spouse's health. There are certain companies which also cover the parents of the employee health as well. So that's why I said such benefits can either be provided directly to the employee or to the spouse of the employee or to the children of the employee or even any other dependents of the employee. So these are the employee benefits covered as per India's 19. Not just health requirement, I'm talking about any other benefit as well. Let's say for suppose, I have a particular school in which, the employer has a particular school in which 
free admission is provided to the employees sufficient enough you need to understand that jamshedpur which is basically where the tata steel is actually set up the entire institutions are maintained by tata be it the healthcare support be it their education support all public infrastructure is provided by tata tata steel itself so all those benefits will also get covered under the standard india's 19 employee benefits then who is an employee an employee can either be a past employee or the present employee so i can provide benefits or an enterprise can provide benefits not just to the current employee but also to the past employment as well look at garment employees they have it they have a healthcare benefit called as cghs central government health scheme and your uh, armed forces have something something called as ehs emergency health services so these services are provided not just to the employees who are currently under employment but are also provided to the employees who have already retired so even post retirement also they are entitled to take the benefit of these kind of schemes central government health schemes and ehs scheme not just covers the employees after retirement but they also cover the spouse of the employee after the retire so all these put together they can be called as employee so and then whenever i use the word employee to define under india's 19 such employee could either be a past employee or could be a present employee future employees you can't know so there is no point of even covering the future employees into the ambit of the definition so a past employee who has already served the organization and certain benefits are still applicable to him or a present employee to whom benefits are being provided by the enterprise all these benefits will come covered under the concept of india's 19 so when i talk about india's 19 what is your india's 19 fundamental what do you mean by india's 19 employee benefits and who is an employee by definition an employee is a person where there is an employer employee relationship which exists if there exists an employer employee relationship then such a person can be called as an employee of an enterprise now when can i say that then there is an employer employee relationship you need to fundamentally understand that there is a separation or there is a distinguishment which the standard does between a principal to principal contracts and principal to agent contracts these principal to agent contracts are covered under the definition of employee but principal to principal contracts are not covered i still did not even start the standard you are using words which i don't even understand what is this principal to principal what is this principal to agent let's say for example me as a qualified chartered accountant i was appointed as a statutory auditor of a company let's say uh, reliance industries limited okay let's dream big okay let's say for suppose i become the auditor of reliance industries limited now look at the concept just because i became the auditor of reliance industries limited doesn't mean that the head of finance of of reliance industries will come up to me and tell me how the audit should be performed i have qualified my exam i know how the audit should be performed i know how to do my audit planning i know how to do my resource allocation i know what to see as far as the audit is concerned i will apply my substantive and compliance techniques in performing my audit which i have learned already so i don't i don't need someone else to come and direct me on how to perform my audit that means as far as the appointment of auditor is concerned that is the discretion of the management out there once the management has appointed me as auditor how to perform my activities or how to discharge my duties it is according to me i plan my audit i allocate my resources i make sure that i apply my techniques so all these things are based on my ideas or my idea of audit or my knowledge regarding the audit so in such cases these contracts are called as principal to principal basis because we are talking about accounting standard i am talking about the example of chartered accounting see but if i want to give a much simpler example let's take a doctor let's say i was diagnosed with a chronic disease and i go to the doctor doctor said immediate surgery is necessary he took me to the operation theater now i tell the doctor doctor i am paying you fees right right agreed i am paying you fees so you perform the operation according to how i want it to be performed so you first take the anesthesia first give me the anesthesia cut me here cut me there then you stitch it again so all these things if i tell the doctor the doctor will first give me anesthesia and ask me to shut so that means though i am paying the doctor 
the doctor is having complete sense of what he has to perform as far as his duty is concerned. I don't have to direct the doctor on how the duty has to be discharged. Clear? So you need to understand that such kind of contracts where even a payment is done, but the contract between the doctor and the patient is purely on principle to principle basis. The doctor is not the agent of the patient and will not perform duties according to what the agent asks him to do. He will perform his duties based on his technical knowledge is concerned. Same thing is the case with an engineer or an architect. All these are technical services. They are professional services where they perform the duty according to what uh, their knowledge regarding that particular ambit is concerned, but they will not perform the duty according to what the enterprise wants or the employer wants. These contracts are called as principle to principle basis. Let's say for example, I have hired a driver on a contract. I asked him to slow down, he will have to slow. If I ask him to stop at a particular place, he will stop at that particular place. So that means though there is a contract, ultimately you need to understand the driver is performing his duties according to the requirements of the employer. So there the relationship is not principle to principle. It is called as principle to agent relationship. To distinguish these two, the standard comes out with a very important aspect called as contract of service and contract for service. Contract of service and contract for service. What is a contract for service? Any professional services which are rendered on principle to principle basis. There is no employer employee relationship and they are excluded from the scope of the standard. But contract of services, they are services which are performed at the direction of the employer on a principle to agent basis where the employer employee relationship exists and therefore they should be included within the scope of the standard. So who is an employee, either the past employee or the present employment, either he is in a full time employment or a part time employment or a casual employment or a contract employment or any kind of an employee gets covered within the definition of India's 19. When I talk about benefits to employee, the benefit can either be in monetary terms or non monetary terms. What is a monetary benefit? Purely in cash, dearness elements, house rent elements, educational elements, traveling elements, leave travel elements. So all these are basically cash elements which are provided to the employee and they are called as monetary benefits. What are non-monetary benefits? Healthcare schemes, education provided in employer school to the students or uh, any training provided to the employees or you can even include a rent free accommodation, a driver given or uh, a, sh a chauffeur driven vehicle free of cost. All these are non-monetary, not in the form of cash. So if you look at your income tax language, these monetary benefits are called as allowances. Non-monetary benefits are generally called as perquisites, your income tax language. Here in our accounting language, we only use the word monetary and non-monetary. We don't use the word allowances and perquisites. I just wrote the word so that you people are clear about what you are basically referring to. And you also can link between income tax act as well as your Standard India's 19 and these monetary or non-monetary benefits can be allowed directly to the employee or to the spouse of the employee or to the children of the employee or any other dependents of the employee. Then we can say that they are covered under the scope of this standard India's 19 accounting for employee benefits. Clear? Now as of now what we understood is what is the scope of the standard? We just understood that this standard talks about certain kind of employees which are covered within the definition and certain benefits which are provided to the employee which are covered under India's 19. Now these employment benefits we are supposed to account for. Look at the name which is given to India's 19. Accounting for employee benefits. So for the purpose of accounting that is recognition and measurement. Accounting means recognizing and measuring. To recognize and measure these employment benefits, I will divide the employee benefits particularly into four categories. Only for the purpose of recognition and measurement, I am doing this, that I am classifying employee benefits into four categories. First one, short term employee benefits. What is a short term employee benefits? A benefit which is a benefit to the employee which falls due, which falls due within 12 months 
from the date of service by the employee is called as short term employee benefit. Best example is salaries. Best example is salary. A salary falls due within 12 months from the date of providing the service. Guys, actually 30 days. So you serve the employer for month of April. I'll have to make sure that the, the employee salary is paid in the next month by May. Sometimes people even paid on 30th April itself. Sometimes people pay it in May 1st. Oh, anytime during the month of May. Since the benefit is accruing to the employee within 12 months from the date of service, you can call them as short term employee benefits. Okay. Second type of benefit is called as post employment benefit. Post employment benefit is nothing but a retirement benefit. A retirement benefit or a post employment benefit is a much broader sense. What is a post employment benefit? That means after the employee leaves the employment, that means there is no longer employer employee relationship. He has now become a past employee to me, but such kind of benefits which are payable after the employment get covered under this definition of post employment benefit. You can include your provident funds. You can include your uh, gratuity paid. You can include your leave, leave encashments. All these are as superannuity. All these are schemes which are provided post employment to the employees and therefore these benefits are called as post employment benefits. For easier sense to understand you consider them as retirement benefits itself. No problem. But remember the word is post employment benefits. Third one other long term benefit. What is an other long term benefit? That means if you serve the organization for a period of let's say five years, I'll give you an additional benefit. Let's say you serve the organization for 10 years. I'll give you another additional benefit. So these benefits are arising to the employee only if he serves the organization for a particular period of time, which is generally longer in length than 12 months. If it is arising within 12 months, then it is a short term benefit. But if any benefit is payable during the course of employment, only because the employee has served the employer for a longer period of time, these benefits are called as long term benefits or other long term benefits. They are not benefits which are paid at the time of end of termination or sorry end of your employment. But these are benefits during employment provided to an employee if he serves the organization for a certain period of time. Third uh, and that is the third one post other long term benefits. Let's come to the fourth one which discusses about termination. Benefit. What is a termination benefit? A termination benefit is a benefit payable to the employee when the employer employee relationship is terminated. When do you say employer employee relationship is terminated? You can say employer employee relationship is terminated when the employer himself is putting an end to the employment. The employer is calling up the employee and saying that Ram Ram, I don't want you. Please leave the organization. Please leave the organization. I don't want you. In today's language, we call it as pink slip. So pink slip is very famous because of your technology companies which are on existing on today's day. They bought out this concept of pink slip. Pink slip is basically a very similar to a post employment, sorry, your termination benefit. Then I give you a pink slip. That means I'll give you three months salary in advance. And I tell you don't come tomorrow. Very famous schemes under termination benefits is what we received under government schemes under government employees, which was called as voluntary retirement scheme. A VRS scheme was announced to the government employees uh, probably early 2000s. Okay. At the same time, even you had bankers who gave some similar scheme called as golden handshake. Golden handshake means from tomorrow don't come. I'll give you your benefits or I'll give I'll accrue all the benefits and I'll give it into your account. So immediately when the core banking software was applied, okay, earlier it was a manual banking. That means you can only bank at your branch in which you have an operation. Today, I might have a branch in Hyderabad, but I might be banking in Bombay with the same bank. So that means core banking software or centralized banking has come into picture. So as soon as centralized banking has come into picture, all the existing staff which were accustomed to using the old techniques, they could not really get up. That is the reason why golden handshake has come in saying that your services are no longer required. You can leave the organization. We will make sure that we are recruiting fresh staff. These are called as Termination benefits, golden handshake, VRS scheme, pink slips, 
all these are termination benefits so fundamentally i'm looking at four benefits out here first one is called as short term benefits second one is called as post employment benefit third one is called as other long term benefit and lastly we call it as termination benefit what is a post employment benefit sorry short term benefit any benefit which is expected to be settled within before wholly before 12 months from the end of the annual reporting period in which the employee renders the related service so employee rendered the related service in a particular year in that year whatever benefits accrue to him if they are falling due within 12 months from the end of the year it is called as short term benefit salaries allowances bonus profit sharing plans compensated absences these are casual leaves all those come under short term employment benefits next one what is a post employment benefits benefits which are basically expected to be settled upon retirement of an employee so after the retirement or after the employer employee relationship is gone what are the benefit which are still continuing to be paid post employment health scheme cghs what i gave you superannuation pensions gratuity all these come under post employment benefits which in our language we can call them as retirement benefits other long term benefits which are payable during the period of employment but only if the employer serve for a particular period of time disability benefit sabbatical leaves these are generally some other long term benefits but it depends upon enterprise to enterprise whether they give such post employment other long term benefits or not what is a termination benefit immediately on termination of employer employee relationship whatever benefit is paid to the employee is called as termination benefit clear so you can have retrenchment compensations you can have voluntary retirement schemes you can have golden handshakes all these will be included under termination benefits these are the four categorizations under which i classify my employee benefits so as far as the accounting is concerned as far as your accounting for employment benefits is concerned to perform this i have divided them into four categories among these four categories we have only three accounting treatments because he says your short term employee benefits number one accounting treatment number two accounting benefit number two accounting treatment is a combination of both post employment benefits as well as other long term benefits which is the most crucial part as far as the standard is concerned lastly termination benefits which have a separate recognition and measure so that means there are three types of accounting treatments given for four types of employment benefits clear so from here we will start with first one short term benefits then we will go into post employment and other long term benefits finally we will discuss about termination benefits
So what is a short term employment benefit? Any benefits which the employee will receive within 12 months from the end of the reporting period in which the employee has rendered the service is called as a short term employee benefit. I'm saying any benefit which the employee is expected to receive within 12 months from the end of the financial year in which he has rendered the service is called as short term employee benefits. Guys, salaries is a classic example. Salaries is a classic example. But don't forget there are further more examples. Bonus. If you remember payment of bonus act, which was a part of your law, you had this concept of minimum bonus to be paid to the employees at the end of the year based on their profit of the enterprise. So that is also amount expected to be paid within 12 months from the end of the reporting period. Clear? Number three. Generally under employment, there are certain leaves which are provided to the employee, which are basically called as employee uh, receive some earned leaves, some casual leaves, some medical leaves. These are leaves which are provided to the employee. That means you can, you need not report to work, but I will still compensate you for whatever uh, leave that you have availed. So such kind of concepts will also get covered under this concept. Casual leave is a very common concept. Guys. Think about a casual leave. I put a casual leave on a particular day saying that I won't be reporting to work because it's my birthday that day. So what happens? So automatically, even though I haven't reported to work, the employer has to pay the salary to me even for that particular day because it is an entitlement which I have. So you need to understand that these are also benefits which are accruing to the employee during the course of his employment. So short term way, short term and um, employment benefits are salaries, wages and other short term benefits, employment, employee profit sharing plans, which are nothing but your bonus, short term compensated absences, which are your earned leaves, medical leaves and your casual leaves. How do I recognize this short term employment benefits? Short term employee benefits should be recognized as expense in the period in which the employee has rendered the service. Even though you said that the benefit is payable within 12 months from the end of the reporting period in which the employee has rendered the service. What is the definition which we have seen? Benefits expected to be settled within 12 months after the end of the annual reporting period in which the employee renders the service. So you are payable within 12 months, but it is arising due to the employment during the current reporting period. Therefore, all such benefits payable to the employee should be recognized as an expense. So it should be recognized as an expense in the period in which the employee has rendered the service on an accrual basis. I pay the salary or not, I will recognize it as expense because it is expected to be paid within 12 months. Bonus, I will create a provision in the current year for payment of bonus, even though I settle it after the end of the financial year. All these are to be provided as expense in the year in which the employee has relate, rendered the service. However, if the benefit paid to the employee during the current reporting period is less than the benefits which are payable, 12 months salary is payable during the current year. I paid 11 months, one more month I will pay in the subsequent year. So what is happening? My benefit paid is only for 11 months. But the liability of pay benefit is for 12 months. In such case, the enterprise reports a liability, a liability called as outstanding salary. Whenever there is a payment of bonus, I identify the bonus only payable only towards the end of the year. But I create a liability for the payment of bonus based on the calculations which I make. Clear? In the same year in which the employee has rendered the service even though the amount is paid in the subsequent year. These are called as liabilities. So I'll recognize a liability when the benefits paid to the employee are less than the amount of benefits which accrue to the employee during the current reporting period. This service in the current reporting period is entitling him to a, to a benefit of 100 rupees. If I pay only 90 and I am expecting the balance 10 rupees to be paid within 12 months from the end of the reporting period, I will report that 10 rupees as a liability. 
What if I paid excess? That means I gave a festival advance. A festival advance was already paid. So what is happening? I will reduce the advance from the salary of the subsequent months. So in such cases, the benefit paid could exceed the benefit payable to the employee. The entitlement of the benefits to the employee during the current reporting period is 100. But I paid 105. That extra 5 rupees, I will reduce it from the salary of the future period. In such case, that extra 5 rupees will be reported as an asset. So I'll recognize an expense to the extent of benefits arising to the employee during the, during the current year for the employee service in the current reporting period. If the benefit paid during the current year is more than the benefits payable, I'll recognize an asset. If the benefits paid are less than the benefits payable to the employee, I'll recognize a liability. Asset is nothing but advances and prepaids and liability is nothing but outstandings and provisions. Clear? Remember, when I measure the short term employment benefits, it should always be done on an undiscounted basis. Why? It should be done on an undiscounted basis because they are falling due at the end of the reporting period itself. What is the discount factor? One, because the year for the discounting is zero and the discount factor becomes one. Therefore, short term employment benefits should always be measured on an undiscounted basis. But sometimes when you need to create a provision like provision for bonus, you need to estimate the provision and all the judgments made in measuring that provision should be disclosed in your notes to accounts. This is a derivation from India's one. India's one says there are multiple accounting estimates which the management makes. The judgment which the management has made has to be disclosed in your notes to accounts whenever the management uses an estimate in presenting its financial statements. Same way, whenever your short term employment benefits, there is an estimate which is being made on, uh, for measuring a provision, then such judgments made in, due, in making that estimates should be disclosed in your notes to accounts. But while measuring short term benefits, I'll always measure it based on an undiscounted basis because the benefits fall due at the end of the financial year itself. Therefore, since they are falling due, you have to make sure that the discount factor is one. No discounting is necessary. Undiscounted basis measurement is necessary for short term employment benefits. Clear? I'll progress to the most important part of the standard regarding short term employment benefits. In short term employment benefits, there's something really important to be discussed upon. So let's see what these are. These are called as short term compensated absences. What do you mean by a short term compensated absence? Your short term compensated absences are simple nothing but casual leaves or medical leaves. These absences are two types of nature. I can classify them broadly into two types. Accumulated absences, non accumulating absence. What is accumulating absences? That employee has an entitlement to 12 casual leaves during a year. During a year, an employee is entitled to take 12 casual leaves. Out of the 12 casual leaves, he availed only 4. 8 casual leaves are not yet availed. Now, employee's HR policy, sorry, employer's HR policy can be of two types. He can say that the remaining 8 which you haven't availed, I'll give you a benefit to avail it in the subsequent years. So in the next year, instead of availing 12 casual leaves, you can avail 12 plus 8 carried forward from the previous year, 20 casual leaves you can avail in the next year. These are called as accumulating short term compensated absences. What are non accumulating? If you don't avail, they will lapse. Generally, casual leaves are accumulating in nature. Medical leaves are non accumulating in nature. Generally, I'm talking about. I am not standardized because it depends upon the HR policy of the employer. The employer's HR policy generally says that the short term absences, if they are of nature of casual leaves, they can accumulate. If they are of medical leave, then they cannot accumulate. I am only talking about general sense. I am not specifically mentioning any particular company. I am saying generally this is what happens. So if the absence, if not availed during the current year, lapses. 
they will lapse if you don't use it in the current year. They are called as non-accumulating short-term compensated absences. Those non-accumulating absences need not be recognized as a liability. So no further accounting treatment is necessary if those short-term compensated absences are lapsing at the end of the reporting period. Clear? They are non-accumulating short-term compensated absences. But what about accumulating short-term compensated absences? This is very interesting. These accumulating short-term compensated absences should be recognized as a liability. They should be recognized as a provision in your financial statements. Now, these accumulating compensated absences are also of two types. Vesting, non-vesting. If they are vesting, that means they are encashable. All those accumulated leaves, you can encash towards the end of your retirement date or after 10 years or after 5 years. Whatever it is. But the employer is giving you a right to encash those leaves instead of using those leaves. Central government employees can encash 300 casual leaves, almost equal to 12 months salary at the end of their retirement date. That is encashable leaves. They are encashable or vesting, accumulating, compensated absences. What is non-vesting then? You can't encash, but you can use. You cannot encash those leaves, but you are entitled to use those leaves. Clear? Whatever is the case, be it vesting in nature, non-vesting in nature, be it encashable, non-encashable, I will have to recognize a provision with respect to these accumulating short-term compensated absences. How do I recognize a provision? I will recognize a provision using the best estimate. What estimate are you talking about? How do I measure this estimate? How do I create a liability or a provision for a short-term compensated absence which is accumulating in nature? Let's see. We will have even questions also on this guys because your new ICA material has included certain questions on these short-term compensated absences. So I will have my heading as short term compensated absences which are particularly accumulating in nature if they are non accumulating then i don't need accounting treatment at all now what are these short term compensated absences which are accumulating in nature and how do we recognize these amounts? Let's say for example, number of days in a year, let's say I have about 365 days in a year, okay? Weekends, 52 weeks, 104 weekends, office does not work, correct? Public holidays or your religious holidays, festivals, we enjoy everything, let's say I take it as 16 days. Okay, so that means the total working days in the organization is about 245. Out of those 245 working days, I am allowing casual leaves to my employee. And my casual leaves available to the employee are, let's say, 15. So, therefore, expected mandates for each employee, each employee, I expect him to work 
for about 230 days. So each year I expect an employee to work for 230 days. So that means for 230 days, working days, I am compensating him with 12 months of salary. Each month I pay him salary. So my 12 month salary is 230 working days equal. If this is the benefit to the employer, their, the employee's work is the benefit to the employer, then this is the cost of such benefit. 12 month salary is the cost of such benefit. So I'm saying an employee can work in the organization for 230 days and he is entitled to receive 12 month salary. Therefore, I am saying to derive a benefit of 230 days of work from an employee, the employer is required to pay 12 months of salary. Clear? Concept very simple so far. Now let's try to understand. Year 1, year 2, year 3. I am just taking 3 years for the ease of it. Let us say for example, each year my working days are estimated to be 245. Let's say the employees is availing some leaves, leaves avail, he is availing some casual leaves. In the first year, let's say he has availed zero leaves. Second year, he has however availed five leaves. Okay. So each year he is entitled to receive 15 casual leaves. First year, nothing he availed. Second year he availed 5, third year he was entitled to avail 15 plus second year's 10, 25 which are accumulated, first year's 15 which is 40, total 40 days he availed of in the third year. Okay. Now try to understand how many working days did he come to the office. He reported to the office entire 245 days in the first year, 240 days in the second year and 205 days in the third year. But understand, there is a carried forward leave as well. At the end of first year, he, had a, he was entitled to carry forward 15 days of leave. At the end of second year, he was entitled to carry forward 25 days of leave. Third year, zero leave. Because he is utilized entirely. Now remember your cost benefit which I have told you. What did I say? The cost of 230 working days of benefit derived from the employee is 12 months of a salary. So let's see. Year 1, if I write this as cost and this is the benefit. Year 2, cost and benefit. Year 3, cost and benefit. Remember, what did I tell you? The cost is 12 months salary. Benefit is 245 working days. In every case, it is same. 12 months salary of the cost is equal to 245 days of working days from that particular employee. But actually, how many days were, what 245 days, I am sorry guys, it is only 230 days, right? After casual leave is only available, he is only entitled to take 230 days of benefit. Sorry, what did I say? 
Yep. 230 working days is 12 months salary. So 230 working days is 12 months salary. But in the first year, the employee served the enterprise for 245 days. That means my benefit is increased by 15 working days. Similarly, next year, he has reported to the office for 240 days. That means additional 10 working days, he has reported to work. But there should be a matching cost as well. Because in the third year, in the last year, he did not report to the office for 230 days. He has reported to the office only for a period of 205 days. That is fundamentally what I'm talking about. So here what I do is, whenever you have this kind of concept, to the extent of this 15 working days which he served extra, I'll recognize a cost. What cost I will recognize? I'll recognize a provision of carried forward leave. Similarly, here 10 days of working days, I'll recognize a provision for 10 days of leave. So the total provision at the end of second year became 25 working days. So when I write a cost, automatically I will debit or I'll credit the provision because I'm using the provision for about 25 days. Because I use the sal I use the benefit only for 205 days. So that means each year, whenever there is a carried forward leave, I have to keep on continuing to create a provision. So what is the benefit that I'll receive? So I'll have to recognize the entry as in the first year. p and account debit to provision for carried forward leave. First year, I'll recognize the same entry for the second year. But when it comes to the third year, I'll have to reverse the entry. Because the provision has been utilized. So provision for carried forward leave account debit. I'm reversing the entry to p and Now you will say, sir, what judgment did you apply? You were saying management estimate requires certain judgments. Such judgment should be disclosed. What judgment did you apply? 15 working days. I have to create a provision. I know 230 working days is equal to 12 months salary. Then what is the value of 15 days salary? But you need to understand that these 15 days are not utilized in the current reporting period. They are reported subsequently. They are utilized subsequently. When they are utilized, what is his salary? Do I know? I don't know what is his salary. Sir, year on year, 15% growth they will give to the employee. So next year salary I can estimate. Do you know next year he'll utilize the leave? I don't know. He can utilize the leave next year. He can utilize the leave in year three. He can utilize the leave at the end of retirement date also. So therefore, I really don't know. This 15 days should be multiplied with what? In the first year, it should be 15 days into what? His estimated salary when he utilizes the leave. This what is nothing but salary per day when the employee utilizes the leave, utilizes carried forward leave. When will he utilize the carried forward leave? That I don't know. But I have to make an estimate. Now you will say, sir, making a provision today, right? Making a provision today. When is this provision being utilized? Somewhere in year three. Even I don't know at the end of first year, I know in future. Year two, year three, year four, year 50 also you can utilize. So my understanding is whenever this utilization is postponed, as on today's date, I'll have to discount it to present value. Because here the provision is being used in the third year. When I'm estimating to create the provision in the first year, shouldn't I create a, a time value of money discounted value? Answer is no. Because it is uncertain. You don't know whether he will utilize the leave next year, whether he will utilize it in year 3. Since it is example, I told you year 3. It could also be in year 10. 
So therefore, for me to discount it, I need a discount rate, which is fine. But I also need how many years I have to discount. How do I know how many years I'll have to discount it? I have no idea. Because I don't know when the employee will utilize the leave. Therefore, I will have to create a provision for carried forward leave of an employee or accumulated compensated absences on an estimated basis. Management makes an estimate to find out what will be his salary when he utilizes the leave and might try to make sure that the provision is calculated. I'll go back to what I have just seen under your carried forward leaves. So provision has to be made on an undiscounted basis since the estimate cannot and the, since the enterprise cannot reliably estimate the year in which such accumulated absences are available. Therefore, whenever the employee, employer makes an estimate, he has to report those judgments as a part of your notes to accounts. Recognize liability based on the management's best estimate. Guys, vesting benefit and non-vesting benefit, they are not measured in the same manner. Why? Encashable benefit. Encashment can only be to the extent of probably basic and DA only. But non-vesting benefit, when I utilize the leave, then in such cases, then I am entitled to much more amount of benefits. Just because I am utilizing a leave, the driver or the, uh, or the vehicle which is given to me cannot be withdrawn for those days. The accommodation which is provided to me free of cost cannot be withdrawn just because I have availed a leave. Therefore, while estimating non-vesting leaves, my value of employee salary is much more than in the case of vesting. Because in case of encashment, I am only entitled to get monetary benefit. Monetary benefit means either your allowances and your salary. That's it. But non-vesting benefit, he is entitled to receive the salary along with monetary as well as non-monetary benefits as well. That is why your estimated value of provision both in case of vesting and non-vesting are significantly different. This is a very critical concept. That's why I said more application of common sense than anything else is required. And this is, uh, the, this is a paragraph on which certain questions has been added by ICA as far as your additional material is concerned. The new um, amended material applicable from 2021 onwards will have certain additional questions with respect to these short term compensated absences for which a provision has to be created.
Yes, guys. Now that we are done with short term compensated absences, we have another short term uh, benefit to an employee which I have to cover. What is the other short term benefit which I have to cover? That is regarding your employee profit sharing plan. Very simple discussion that we'll do under profit sharing plan. What is a profit sharing plan? Bonus plan. As simple as that. So, towards the end of every year, the employer or the enterprise has to create a particular provision regarding the payment of certain commission or bonus to the employees. Some people have a commission because based on the sale they might get a commission. Some people are entitled to receive some profit sharing plans uh, in the form of a bonus. So whenever I create this kind of provision, it is a charge against profit. Though you calculate it based on the profit, I will not call it as an appropriation, but it should be a charge. It is a present obligation arising from a past event. His past service in the in during the preceding financial year is entitling him to receive a certain portion as a present obligation or a present benefit. Therefore, the ent entity or the enterprise has a present obligation arising from a past event and a reliable estimate should be made by the enterprise. On this basis, I will create a provision, a provision for bonus a minimum bonus of 8.33% on the total profit of the enterprise. So that is an estimate of the provision, which I'll have to make sure that I'm recognizing it in my p &L. So I'll recognize the entry as staff cost or employee cost account debit to provision for bonus or provision for employee profit sharing plan. This is the entry which I'll recognize. So I'll repeat the entry guys. The entry which I'll recognize here is staff cost account debit to provision for bonus simple sense go with the language of the standard employee profit sharing plan so i'll recognize this entry but there should be an amount as well this amount should be a management estimate this amount at which i will create this provision is purely a management estimate this staff cost should in turn be recognized or charged to p &L. Clear? This is the provision which I recognize or this is the entry which I recognize for profit sharing plans. That's why I said recognize as a charge against profit for the entity's present obligation resulting from past event and where a reliable estimate can be made by the enterprise. Now you'll say, sir, what if a reliable estimate cannot be made by the enterprise? If a reliable estimate cannot be made for a provision, then it has to be reported as a contingent liability, which we will cover as a part of India's 37. When we talk about India's 37, I will tell you when a provision cannot be reliably estimated, they generally recognize a contingent liability. But when I stick to this employee profit sharing plan, sometimes let's say, the HR policy of the company is designed in such a way that the employee profit sharing plans are only entitled to employees after five years from the date of their employment. They are entitled to the employee only after five years. That means they are not falling due within 12 months from the end of the reporting year in which the employee has rendered the service. They are not payable within 12 months. They are payable after five years. In such cases, these benefits will not be categorized as short term benefits, but they should be considered as other long term benefits. Clear? So in such cases, discounted approach is necessary. So we will see that as a part of other long term benefits. Clear? So if the benefits are expected to be settled beyond 12 months, then it is considered as another long term benefit where I will give a treatment on a discounted basis. And that is the last item or last concept to be covered under your short term employment benefits. So what are your short term employment benefits that we have covered? Salaries, wages and other short term benefits, they have to be recognized on an accrual basis. 
employee profit sharing plan it should be a provision based on the best estimate of the management short term compensated absences i told you only accumulated absences will require an additional accounting treatment non accumulating absences does not require any additional accounting treatment again short term compensated absences which are accumulating in nature i said the provision should be based on whether the absence is uh, vesting in nature or non vesting in nature clear and that will bring us to the end of discussion on this concept of short term employee benefits and the last part that we have discussed is your employee profit sharing plan which should be a charge against profit based on the best estimate of the management clear